of the things which are in our power and not in our power, of all the faculties, he will find not one which is capable of contemplating itself, and consequently, not capable either of approving or disproving. How far does the grammatic art possess the contemplating power? As far as forming a judgment about what is written and what is spoken. And how far music, as far as judging about melody, does either of them contemplate itself? By no means. But when you must write something to your friend, grammar will tell you what words you must write. But whether you should write or not, grammar will not tell you. And so it is with music as to musical sounds. But whether you should sing at the present time, and play on the lute, or do neither, music will not tell you. What faculty, then, will tell you? That which contemplates both itself and all other things. And what is this faculty? The rational faculty, for this is the only faculty that we have received which examined itself, what it is, and what power it has, and what is the value of this gift, and examined all of the faculties, for what else is there which tells us that golden things are so beautiful, for they do not say so themselves. Evidently, it is the faculty which is capable of judging of appearances, what else judges of music, grammar, and other faculties proves their uses and points out the occasions for using them? Nothing else. As then it was fit to be so, that which is best for all, and supreme over all, is the only thing which the gods have placed in our power, the right use of appearances. But all other things they have not placed in our power, was it because they did not choose? I indeed think that, if they had been able, they would have put these other things also in our power, but they certainly did not. For as we exist on the earth, and are bound to such a body, and to such companions, how was it possible for us not to be hindered? as to these things by externals. But what says Zeus, Epictetus, if it were possible, I would have made both your little body and your little property free, and not exposed to hindrance. But now, be not ignorant of this, this body is not yours, but it is clay, finely tempered. And since I was not able to do for you what I have mentioned, I have given you a small portion of us, this faculty of pursuing an object and avoiding it, and the faculty of desire and aversion, and, in a word, the faculty of using the appearances of things. And if you will take care of this faculty and consider it, your only possession, you will never be hindered, never meet with impediments, you will not lament, you will not blame, you will not flatter any person. Well, do these seem to you small matters? I hope not. Be content with them, then, and pray to the gods. But now, when it is in our power to look after one thing, and to attach ourselves to it, we prefer to look after many things, and to be bound to many things, to the body, and to property, and to brother, and to friend, and to child, and to slave. Since then, we are bound to many things. We are depressed by them and dragged down. For this reason, when the weather is not fit for sailing, we sit down and torment ourselves, and continually look out to see what wind is blowing. It is north. What is that to us? When will the west wind blow? When it shall choose, my good man, or when it shall please Aeolus, for God has not made you the manager of the winds, but Aeolus, what then? We must make the best use that we can of the things which are in our power, 
and use the rest according to their nature. What is their nature, then? As God may please. Must I, then, alone have my head cut off? What? Would you have all men lose their heads, that you may be consoled? Will you not stretch out your neck, as Laternius did at Rome, when Nero ordered him to beheaded? For when he had stretched out his neck, and received a feeble blow, which made him draw it in for a moment, he stretched it out again, and a little before, when he was visited by Aphroditus, Nero's freedman, who asked him about the cause of offense which he had given, he said, If I choose to tell anything, I will tell your master. What then should a man have in readiness in such circumstances? What else, then, what is mine, and what is not mine, and permitted to me, and what is not permitted to me? I must die. Must I then die lamenting? I must be put in chains. Must I then also lament? I must go into exile. Does any man then hinder me from going with smiles and cheerfulness and contentment? Tell me the secret which you possess. I will not, for this is my power. But I will put you in chains. Man, what are you talking of? Me in chains? You may fetter my leg, but you will not, but, but my will not even Zeus can overpower. I will throw you into prison. My poor body, you mean, I will cut your head off. When, then, have I told you that my head alone cannot be cut off? These are the things which philosophers should meditate on, which they should write daily, in which they should exercise themselves. Theracia used to say, I would rather be killed today than banished tomorrow. What then did Rufus say to him? If you choose death as the heavier misfortune, how great is the folly of choice. But if, as the lighter, who has given you the choice? Will you not study to be content? with that which has been given to you? What then did Agrippinus say? He said, I am not a hindrance to myself. When it was reported to him that his trial was going on in the Senate, he said, I hope it may turn out well. But it is the fifth hour of the day. This was the time when he was used to exercise himself, and then take the cold bath. Let us go and take our exercise. After he had taken his exercise, one comes and tells him, You have been condemned to banishment, he replies, or to death. To banishment. What about my property? It is not taken from you. Let us go to Arcea then, he said and dine. This it is, to have studied what a man ought to study, to have made desire aversion free from hindrance, and free from all that a man would avoid. I must die. If now I am ready to die, if after a short time I now dine because it is the dinner hour, after this I will then die. How? Like a man who gives up what belongs to another. Chapter 2 How a man, on every occasion, can maintain his proper character. To the rational animal, only is the irrational intolerable. But that which is rational is tolerable. Blows are not naturally intolerable. How is that? See how the Lacedomians endure a whipping when they have learned that whipping is consistent with reason. To hang yourself is not intolerable. When, then, you have the opinion that it is rational, you go and hang yourself. In short, if we observe 
we shall find that the animal man is painted by nothing so much as by that which is rational, and, on the contrary, attracted to nothing so much as to that which is rational. But the rational and irrational appear such in, in a different way to different persons, just as the good and bad, the profitable and the unprofitable. For this reason, particularly, we need discipline, in order to learn how to adapt the preconception of the rational and the irrational to the several things conformally to nature. But in order to determine the rational and the irrational, we use not only the of external things, but we consider also what is appropriate to each person. For to one man it is consistent with reason to hold a chamber pot for another, and to look to this only, that if he does not hold it, he will receive stripes, and he will not receive his food. But if he shall hold the pot, he will not suffer anything hard or disagreeable. But to another man, not only does the holding of a chamber pot appear intolerable for himself, but intolerable also for him to allow another to do this office for him. If, then, you ask me whether you should hold the chamber pot or not, I shall say to you that the receiving of food is worth more than the not receiving of it, and the being scourged is a greater indignity than not being scourged. So that... If you measure your interest by these things, go, and hold the chamber pot. But this, you say, would not be worthy of me. Well then, it is you who must introduce this consideration into the inquiry, not I. For it is you who know yourself, how much you are worth to yourself, and at what price you sell yourself. For men sell themselves at various prices. For this reason, when Florus was deliberating whether he should go down to narrow spectacles and also perform in them himself, Agrippinus said to him, Go down. And when Florus asked Agrippinus, Why do not you go down? Agrippinus replied, Because I do not even deliberate about the matter. For he who has once brought himself to deliberate about such matters and to calculate the value of external things, comes very near to those who have forgotten their own character. For why do you ask me in the question whether death is preferable or life? I say, life. Pain or pleasure? I say, pleasure. But if I do not take a part in the tragic acting, I shall have my head struck off. Go then and take a part, but I will not. Why? Because you consider yourself to be the only one thread of those which are in the tunic. Well then, it was fitting for you to take care how you should be like the rest of men, just as the thread has no design to be of anything superior to the other threads. But I wish to be purple, that small part which is bright, it makes all the rest appear graceful and beautiful. Why then do you tell me to make myself like the many? And if I do, how shall I be still purple? Priscus Halvidius also saw this and acted conformly. For when Vespasian sent and commanded him to go into the Senate, he replied, It is in your power not to allow me to be a member of the Senate. But so long as I am, I must go in. Well... Go in then, says the emperor, but say nothing. Do not ask my opinion, and I will be silent. But I must ask your opinion. And I must say what I think right. But if you do, I shall put you to death. When then did I tell you that I am immortal? You will do your part, and I will do mine. It is your part to kill. It is mine to die but not in fear, yours to banish me, mine to depart without sorrow. What good, then, did Priscus do, who was only a single person, 
And what good does the purple do for the toga? Why? What else than this that is conspicuous in the toga as purple and is displayed also as a fine example to all other things? But in such circumstances another would have replied to Caesar, who forbade him to enter the Senate. I thank you for sparing me. But such a man, Vespasian, would not even have forbidden to enter the Senate. For he knew that he would either sit there like an earthen vessel, or, if he spoke, he would say that Caesar wished, and add even more. In this way, an athlete also acted who was in danger of dying, unless his private parts were amputated. His brother came to the athlete, who was a philosopher, and said, Come, brother, what are you going to do? Shall we amputate this member and return to the gymnasium? But the athlete persisted in his resolution and died. When someone asked Epictetus how he did this, as an athlete or a philosopher, as a man, Epictetus replied, and a man who had been proclaimed among the athletes at the Olympic Games and had contended in them, a man who had been familiar with such a place and not merely anointed in Baton school, another would have allowed even his head to be cut off if he could have lived without it. Such is that regard to character which is so strong in those who have been accustomed to introduce it of, them, of themselves and conjoined with other things into their deliberations. Come then, Epictetus, shave yourself. If I am a philosopher, I answer, I will not shave myself, but I will take off your head. If that will do you any good, take it off. Some person asked, How then shall every man among us perceive what is suitable to his character? How, he replied, does the bull alone, when the lion has attacked, discover his own powers and put himself forward in defense of the whole herd? It is plain that with the powers, the perception of having them is immediately conjoined. And therefore, whoever of us has such powers will not be ignorant of them. Now a bull is not made suddenly, nor a brave man, but we must discipline ourselves in the winter for the summer campaign, and not rashly run upon that which does not concern us. Only consider at what price you sell your own will. If for no other reason, at least for this, that you sell it, not for a small sum. But that which is great and superior perhaps belongs to Socrates, and such as are like him. Why then, if we are naturally such, are not a very great number of us like him? Is it true then, that all horses become swift, that all dogs are skilled in tracking footprints. What, then, since I am naturally dull, shall I, for this reason, take no pains? I hope not. Epictetus is not superior to Socrates. But if he is not inferior, this is enough for me, for I shall never be a Milo, and I do not neglect my body, nor shall I be a Croesus, and yet I do not neglect my property. Nor, in a word, do we neglect looking after anything, because we despair of reaching the highest degree.